Right. And by the time Constantine came along, four centuries later, or three centuries later, uh, he would have a pretty hard job suddenly deciding we're going to put these books in the Bible and let the whole world accept them. So, Because what are you going to do with all the books that are already out, that are in agreement yeah, with yeah, each other? Yeah, There'll soon be found a discrepancy. Right. He, he would have no way of changing Jesus into a God later. Right. And having that accepted when all the manuscripts were already out around the world. Exactly. And uh, as we find today, of all the manuscripts that we do have, Something like two to three percent, at the most, were under the control of Rome. Absolutely amazing. We'll, we'll be right back with Jonathan Gray. Stay there. Don't go away. Um, it, it, it's very interesting to, to notice that uh, not only do we have the Gospels, but we have an enormous number of early Christian writers in the first, second, and third centuries quoting from the gospel. So even if we did not have the New Testament in our hands, Dr. Bill, we could virtually reconstruct it from all the quotations. There's more than 86,000 quotes from it among early Christian writers. Right. All from before Constantine's time. Now, um, so extensive are these quotations that the New Testament could virtually be reconstructed from them without the use of the original manuscripts. Now, um, I'd like to just introduce what, why Constantine is mentioned by these critics. Yeah, why did they do that? When now, Constantine Con himself was, was himself yeah. a sun worshipper and uh, not an exactly nice guy. You're right. He was a shrewd <laughs> politician. Oh, yeah. He sought to unite the two great factions of his empire, paganism and Christianity. Right. Now, what he did was he looked around for a form of authority that could help unite Christians and pagans. And about a 100 years earlier, a man down in Egypt called Oregon had paved the way. Now, he was a, a heretic. Who, he, he claimed to be a Christian, but he claimed that he would not teach Christianity unless he could mix it with paganism. He wanted to unite it just as Constantine did. And so to make Christianity more acceptable to pagans, he thought he needed to play down Jesus' God nature. So he chopped passages out of his Bible, he added others in, and changed some others. And this watered-down Bible suited Constantine just fine, and he ordered 50 copies to be of this mutilated Bible to be made. Now... One of these 50 copies is believed to be the surviving Vaticanus, and another one is the Alexandrinus. And, uh, oh, really? And despite, the same... these, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's despite these mutilations, the same list of 27 books was kept. And so when the critic tells you that Constantine's bishops in Rome inserted books into the Bible to make Jesus more godlike, mm. uh, I'd suggest to any listener to answer this way. Just gently ask the critic for his stockpile of evidence. Now, Constantine did create a compromised religion, but he did not rewrite the New Testament. And the fact that we have 97% of all manuscripts which were scattered from Japan right across to Great Britain and, and, and Ireland and throughout Europe and, and the Middle East, by which we can, can compare the... the corrupted manuscripts that Constantine got his hands onto, that 97% majority is ignored by the critics, and they zero in on the 3% that Constantine did, and that, to me, is not honest reporting. Exactly, and what they're doing right. is they're taking uh, uh, basically books that were been modified or mutilated and, and trying to use them as a historical document to disprove the uh, authenticity and if you actually know all of the facts that happened there, the reason why they set uh, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, up and did it because they knew that he was coming as the real, quote, king of the Jews, and not just the house of Judah, but the house of Joseph and, of course, of all of the earth. And that's what's, what's happening yeah. now. We're, we're approaching again in this time and day. We're approaching the final steps to set up the abomination that desolates which is a universal parliament of religions announced by Barry Chomish just earlier this week. Uh, we're, we're sitting literally in a situation where we have a false prophet about to enter the White House telling us we're going to have peace and security when the economy is trashing and we're heading into more wars. And we have the rise of the Russian bear right out of Ezekiel 38 and 39. People need to wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, the Bible wasn't written to be 
some bizarre document. It was written to be a love letter from God to say, if you listen to me and you heed and you humble yourself and pray, I'll save you. If you don't, you're going to face some really bad days. Oh, yes. Uh, this is all very relevant. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm glad that you're bringing it into our day because uh, it, it's not just... We're not dealing with history of the past. We're dealing with a living God and we're dealing with a, uh, a reality that was foretold back there in the Scriptures. And we're coming right into that time now. Yeah, exactly. Now, I, I've been asked uh, to, to um, I've been asked by people in the last few weeks to uh, to, to respond to uh, this New Testament problem, as they call it. Uh, they say, "All right, if if you uh, if you say that uh, there has not been any alteration, where are the oldest surviving copies? How old are they really?" Well, sorry to be a spoil sport to the critics, but there are at least two New Testament manuscripts fragments which date right back to the first century. We have right. one from the Gospel of Mark before 50 AD, and we have the Gospel of Matthew 66 AD, and you couldn't get much better than that. No, that's, that's the yeah. lifetime of the original apostles. Yeah, that's right, basically within their lifetime, within uh, 30 days, 30 years of the uh, crucifixion. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And now, are... if somebody were to write uh, a, a biography of any of the American presidents that are still alive, going back, say, 20 years even, uh, Nixon or whoever, uh, and was to make up his life story, or even to claim that he was God, uh, that would soon be... There'd be a huge uproar. People would soon be able to, to disprove the whole matter. But there was no such controversy concerning Jesus Christ in the days of the apostles. The, the message went out, uh, the, the facts were placed there, and uh, the, uh, the, the and multitudes, millions of people who could check on this with, with sources who would easily contradict it, such as the Jewish leaders and so on. Right. Uh, Yet despite that, the evidence was so strong that it went like a bushfire, it went, went wild. It was a phenomenon that could not be disproved. I think that's a very important point. Well, and here's the most interesting phenomenon. The, the real reason why the uh, Roman emperor, which was the most powerful man in that time in the world, uh, literally made, quote, Christianity the state religion, amalgamating it with uh, paganism, trying to bring in pagan feast days, was specifically because it was the truth and he had to stomp it out. And this is his clever way of trying to do that. So it further proves yeah. that. So, I mean, it's like the converse. There's your proof. As they say, don't believe anything until you see strong government denial. Well, this is a form of government denial in the early Roman days. We'll be back in a moment with Jonathan Gray. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report with Jonathan Gray and your website. Again, Jonathan is before us. www.beforeus.com. That's very easy. B E F O R E U S dot com. Uh, please continue. That's right. Uh, yes, um, the charge has been made that uh, during, despite the early dating of the Gospels, once, you've, once it's been proved that they were dated early, then now the objection comes up. Despite that, there's a time gap between Jesus and the writing of the Gospels. And during those several years during which the accounts would have been memorized and transmitted orally, but you can't depend on oral memory to preserve records accurately. Now, that's the objection. Now, on first thought, you might think that sounds pretty valid. But then we need to ask, how reliable is the oriental memory? For a start, now, this is just one of two answers. The first one relates to Oriental memory. Now, all of Jewish education consisted of rote memory. In fact, entire books were memorized word for word. Right. Yeah. And uh, Jewish rabbis could even uh, recite off the whole Old Testament. And students who were trained from the age of 12, Jewish students, were expected to remember by rote what they were taught. 